Hello, this is uh, Jim and I'm Ralph. We're here today to talk about building functional parts from cast urethane. Uh, a lot of times when you, want, when you need to have a prototype model built, it's sufficient to build a single rapid prototype, whether or not it's a 3D printed part or an SLA part, for example. But oftentimes you may get into a situation where you need specific material properties or additional quantities, and at that point it may make sense to take a look at casting urethanes. From this uh, point, we're going to go over to the computer and look at the first stage of, uh, of what needs to be done once we've got a math file. So, let's go over there. Let's do it. Okay, we're at the computer. The first phase, once we get uh, data from our customer, is uh, to take a look at it. So, we're going to pull this file up, which we have on the screen, look at it for size, material volume, and then see if there's any features that would be a concern when we go to tooling on, the, on this job. So, let me rotate this part around on the uh, screen. We see the A surface now on this. Look back at the B surface. On it, everything looks pretty straightforward. This is a pretty cut and dry type of uh, type of a design here. We've got our out, uh, outer dimensions on the part, and material volume is already listed on this. Um, we'll go back and just check the data to verify that uh, there's no errors on it or that it doesn't need any repair. And that's uh, very simple as going to uh, the tools and verify. And then the screen comes up and shows me that we've got uh, one, uh, one part, one shell, and no errors in it. So we know at this point the file is good to go uh, from, the, uh, from the prototype standpoint on it. Um, some things that you look for on these parts um, are any thin sections. We do have some limitations when we're building models with uh, printing, 3D printing. And typically we want to be in the 30 to 40 thousandths of an inch as a minimum wall thickness. Now we've looked at this part already. I know that uh, we have no concerns in that regard. So really at this point we just print the, uh, print the data off so that we've got a file to take to the mold shop and uh, let those gentlemen look at the, again, A and B surfaces on it and uh, determine uh, how long it's going to take for them to, to build a mold for us. So pretty straightforward. Um, there are a number of different types of data that can be supplied to us, but what we really have to have is a 3D solid model file. Now it can be in, in a number of different formats and we can convert to the STL files that we need for the rapid prototype equipment, but um, again, as long as it's a solid model, we're good. We wouldn't be able to use something like a wireframe and what a lot of people refer to uh, for a good solid model is a part shape that is considered watertight. So all the uh, surfaces that are generated during the design have to be melded together, stitched together in a fashion again to make a watertight model. So that's an example of a, uh, a straightforward, what we'd call an AB tool uh, for a, uh, for a urethane, uh, urethane model. So very good. So Ralph, we're back from the computer now. And of course, this is the part that you had on the computer. Nice looking part. <laughs> yeah, it's a, that's a beauty. That's a beauty. Uh, I've got a few questions for you, and, and what we're trying to do with this video is explain uh, the process of how this actually works, and what you can do, what you can't do, uh, how, it, how it mixes in with the 3D models, uh, the 3D printers, rather. Um, so the first question is, this is urethane. Can you do this on a 3D printer? No, uh, no you can't. Uh, obviously they're making some, some advances with uh, 3D printing and all the different processes and added manufacturing, but uh, the actual urethanes have not, uh, cannot be, uh, do not come off of printed machines. So, so how does this compare, the urethane parts, how do they compare with what you would get off of a regular 3D printer? Well, typically you're going to get some better material properties with the urethanes and that's one area that really drives people to using a urethane. A uh, good example is that part you just picked up, a, uh, a rubber bellows, and you actually need, the customer needs a functional part, you know, in rubber with good memory and good tear strength. Um, while we can build some parts in, uh, in rubber materials with the 3D printers, they just don't have the quality that you can get by casting a part uh, from the urethane. So that's, that's uh, one very important part. Um, Another area, you know, while we're talking about the, the softness or, or durometer, as it's called, of these materials, you can vary at a really wide range. And it gets down to the soft materials that I equate to jello, 
and then all the way up to some very rigid materials. Um, they're very stiff and strong, and you can get some very high impact resistance with these products, um, as well as some relatively high temperature uh, capabilities. Uh, some of these materials that we use, I know, are uh, 340 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a bit, uh, quite a bit higher than what uh, urethanes a few years ago had. So, seeing some improvements in that, but you know, typically uh, the material properties being more robust, and then a wider range of options when it comes to uh, to hardness or even color. So there's a couple things that, that I've got definite questions here. This will come off the machine, and of course it's going to be clear white. Um, and you can you can make them in the 3D machines uh, or the SLA machines. If you want quantities, you're going to want to build a mold for this, right? Typically, yes. That's another reason that uh, people go with the uh, the urethane castings or a silicone tool in urethane castings. Um, and it's difficult to say at which point that the, the urethanes become more cost effective, but generally speaking, the larger the part, the fewer pieces you would need to make the urethanes more cost effective. Um, just a rough example, if, for example, we were going to build a, uh, a part that was uh, a little bigger than this, uh, 12 by 12 by 5 inches, for example, and the model cost $1,000 and the tool cost $1,000. Uh, average price for the part uh, could be a hundred dollars so in that particular uh, situation you would only need three or more parts to make the urethane more cost-effective so, so you could you could virtually uh, if you needed five or ten parts it may be more cost-effective just to make them all with the SLA machine as opposed um, to doing that it, it very well may be if the parts were small and you can run them all at the same time in the SLA machine um, Yes, it could be more cost effective. You have to look at each job, you know, as an individual, you know, job by job and see yeah. where that uh, price uh, effectiveness you'd, comes in. You'd cost it both ways. Correct. Cost it both ways and see which is advantageous. If, if I wanted to get a part like this that had a, a difference in hardness, say I wanted to have a, a rubber seal on here, can you do that? Can you have two different hardnesses in the same part? Yeah, that's another uh, another beauty of uh, doing the uh, urethanes. You can do what's called a dual durometer or a two-shot part. Um, fairly common is that we do some type of a housing with a seal on it. And uh, you've you got a couple different ways you can go about that. But basically, you're going to build the substrate or the rigid part first and then put it into a, uh, a secondary tool that has the seal. Uh, in that tool and then just over mold around the uh, the rigid part with the soft part so yes dual durometer parts or two shot parts are are quite common um, as well as over molds and that's another area that we get asked um, can you over mold a thread insert for example into our part uh, the answer is yes very easily that's uh, that's that's easily done and uh, we do it all the time so really uh, all you do is take your uh, your model your SLA model and if you had an area that you wanted to put a thread insert in, just uh, mount that insert into the part before you do the tool. And generally, we put a screw of stud into the insert and then uh, uh, build a tool around that. And so each time you go to cast a part, you just put the uh, uh, insert back into the tool in its proper location and mold around it. So it works very well for, uh, for over molding applications. I see, I notice all these are black and you got white one that come right out of the machine. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a gray one. Uh, do you have to do you have to paint these or? Yeah, for the uh, for the patterns, we have to put a uh, a pattern finish on the parts. So anything that's going to be on the A surface are going to be seen um, in the end. We'll take some uh, some pretty uh, in depth procedures on that, sand the thing all off, and then prime it up, and make sure that the pattern itself looks as good as the finished part needs to be. So um, anything on the outside again is uh, sanded and primed. Um, to accomplish that. Um, I, that leads in to uh, finishing on the back side of a part of the uh, B surface. You don't really have to spend all the time on the back side of a part. You just need to clean it up enough so that the uh, rubber tool, the silicone, will pull off of the part um, easily and not, uh, not damage the tool. Because it's not a show surface. Right, it's not a show surface. You don't need to spend a lot of extra time or charge uh, extra hours for finishing something that's not seen. So. What, what kind of options are there for higher quantities? Well, if you get into, uh, and what we, what's fairly common is for small components, small buttons, uh, switches and that type of thing, where a customer might need to have two or three hundred parts, uh, we can do a multi-cavity tool. 
So if we're going to do a 10 cavity tool, we would just build 10 SLA models, pattern finish them, and then the um, the mold makers would design the uh, tool to accommodate all 10. And every time you shoot it, then you get 10 parts off. Um, we guarantee 50 shots uh, off each of our tools. And so, you know, with a 10 cavity tool, we could uh, easily produce 500 parts and conceivably more. So this is mainly for low volume production or prototypes? Prototype, prototype or low volume production, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Sometimes uh, we do it for, you know, it's considered bridge tooling. To get, uh, get a few parts in your hand, maybe it's a mule build or you just need to have a couple functional parts or, you know, 10, 20 parts uh, to use functionally before your production parts uh, are delivered. Did you say you can overmold with these? Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, overmold, sure. We could do a hard ring in this thing. Um, I've had applications where we would put a uh, stiffening ring uh, around where you're going to clamp something, you know, and that could be put into the tool and overmold it around it. So, yeah, a lot of different applications for overmolding. So there's yeah. a, lot of, a lot of opportunities to do different things here. Oh, yeah, absolutely, you know, and there's different colors that can be had. Um, the majority of our parts are black. But for the customer that needs to have a uh, color matched part, we can uh, send the uh, color information or a paint chip to our suppliers and they'll uh, custom blend a color for us. Um, most of the materials come in a neutral color and then we dye them black or we have them dyed black at the, uh, at the suppliers. Um, but yeah, certainly we can do it in, in color should that, uh, should that be needed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are we going to take a look at one of the tools? Yeah, we can go over and, uh, and take a look at a tool and yeah, go from there, you bet. Let's go over to the mold shop. All right. Well, Jim, we're uh, out in the mold shop here. We've got, uh, got our chain guard that uh, we've showed you the, from the beginning with the CAD model on it, uh, the SLA equipment that we built the uh, pattern on. From there, once that uh, model comes off of the machine, we bring it back to the mold shop and our pattern makers will take that, sand it up real nice, do the primer coat on it, like we looked at that one gray part uh, in, the, uh, in the lab, and then determine how they want to build a tool. In this particular instance, uh, the person is using this model, or these, these parts, as low volume production. So, to accomplish more shots or more life on the tool, they've used this uh, fiberglass section. So we have a hybrid tool here. It's half fiberglass, half silicone rubber on that. And uh, you can see the part that we've shot. Very good quality. I don't know if you can pick the surface detail up, but this is very smooth on this stuff, as well as the silicone. There's no pits, no bubbles in that. It's as smooth as a baby's bottom. So top quality, uh, top quality tooling for this job. And you can get a lot of shots off this part. So real nice setup, works very good. You can also see the wood frame that's uh, added onto this. This is not something that's mandatory, but something that adds a degree of um, quality, a higher level of quality uh, and durability to our tool. So that's, uh, that's a nice unit. Yeah, so, so. These, what are these over here? Well, what we've got here is an application of a, uh, a multi-cavity tool. Um, again, small parts. Um, person was looking to have a couple hundred of these things shot, so we did a 10 cavity tool. I, I believe it's said I'd have to actually count them again. But uh, again, we can typically get about 50 shots off a tool. So if you've got 10, uh, 10 cavities, um, you know, that, that tool would be good for producing 500 parts. So just an example of a, a small part in a multi-cavity tool. Both silicone halves on that. And uh, the silicone rubber, when we build these, is poured. We buy uh, silicone in 55-gallon drums, and there's a, a meter mix unit on the top so it uh, mixes the A and B portion of the silicone and we pump that into the tools. So, so once, these are, once these are made then you're going to go through and, and somehow you're going to inject the material into here and then you got to get all the air out of it. Precisely, yeah, precisely. The, um, on a part this big, we would, again, we would use a meter mix machine on it that uh, mixes the part A, the, the resin and the hardener together goes through a static mixing tube so we don't introduce any air while we're mixing uh, the urethane. Um, you could mix urethane by hand, but you've got to go back and degas it if you do that just to get the air bubbles out of it. And what do so, you use the tank for? Well, the tank is for pressurizing and uh, we typically pressurize the silicone rubber when we're building a tool. And if they're larger parts and if we've got enough cure time, we can actually pressurize uh, the casting of the urethane as well. 
but uh, that helps to uh, eliminate any air bubbles that you might have in the in the tool on that or the part. So, so this takes you from the math model all the way through the, the SLA. Yep. Through your mold. Yep. And this is the end of you know where we get to with the uh, the finish tool on it, and this tool again is um, good for probably over a hundred parts at least on this thing and the, and the um, fiberglass side probably considerably more than that. But uh, yeah, the design, you know, to get the air out of the tools, which is always important, that's, that's a real art. And that's something that the mold maker determines where he wants to vent parts and how, uh, how he's gonna about, go about doing that. So yeah, this is not really, a, a th this time. has been around for quite some time, yes, but it still has a niche or a fit that works very well. So depending on what your application is, you definitely want to keep this in mind because it may be the way you want to go. Maybe the process that you should be using, you know. So keep that in mind. Yeah, right, right material for the right parts, right? Amen. Yep. Thank you. Thank you.